Nia. No. Whether it's Nia, the devotees are Niyako. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, today is the uh, appearance day of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And uh, one of his most uh, amazing forms, unusual forms, unique forms, a form that is unlike any other form. Krishna has so many qualities. It says this, there's two things that you can never, never understand. Even the greatest of all spiritualists can never understand two things, or fully understand. Krishna's qualities, and Radharani's love. These two things are impossible to describe or even to imagine. But because we are commissioned to speak about the Supreme Lord, there's a verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto. It says that a little bird may have some wing power and due to that power of his wings the bird can fly into the sky but the sky is unlimited and the bird's power for flying is limited <laughs> so the bird can never fly into the unlimited sky so to try to describe the qualities pastimes characteristics and dealings with his devotees of the Lord is impossible. It's like a little bird trying to fly into the unlimited sky. But still we try. So by the mercy of the great souls, we'll try to speak something about today's most auspicious day. It's most auspicious because it's the appearance of the Lord. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Dristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pasyati Nirvisatarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasavi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare hmm. Srimad Bhagavatam in the 8th canto describes in full the pastimes of the Lord's appearance as Sri Vamana Dev <laughs> and uh, before I actually begin the description, I'll give a little bit of the history of the setting of how the Lord appeared. <laughs> hmm. uh, one very powerful demon named Bali Maharaj worshipped his spiritual master Sukracharya with great opulence and with great devotion. And by that worship, he became empowered. <laughs> and by that empowerment, he decided to attack the demigods. <clears throat> Bali was already powerful, but because of his worship of the spiritual master, pure worship, he became more powerful, extremely powerful. And so when the demons went to attack the heavenly planets, the demigods had no chance. <laughs> so rather than to fight, they just abandoned their abodes and left, knowing there was no chance to defeat the demons. <laughs> Bali became king of the entire created world. <laughs> from the high, from the lower planets to the middle planets to the higher planets, Bali Maharaj was the king. <laughs> and he was the leader. 
of the daiches or the demons. <clears throat> Indra is the king of heaven. Indra is a very dutiful servant of the Lord. Sometimes he makes mistakes. Gets himself in trouble, as we read sometimes. But still, he tries his best to serve the Lord as the king of the heavenly realm. Indra's mother is Aditi. Aditi was very much disturbed at heart, seeing her son and all his followers just, you know, removed from the heavenly realm. So she approached her husband and said, what can we do? I'm in distress. My sons are no longer ruling. And of course, this is a great calamity for the universe also. So what to do? <laughs> Kashyapa Muni prayed, and by his prayer, he said, you must perform a sacrifice. And if you perform this sacrifice very successfully, you will get the Supreme Personality of Godhead as your son. <laughs> so with great determination and as much devotion as she could, she performed one ceremony called the Peyovrata sacrifice. It's described in this sex section of the difficult and austerities she had to perform in order to execute this great sacrifice. But she was determined. What is determination? Determination is the feature of success. <laughs> Every endeavor, there is always some obstacles. And of course, when we take up spiritual life, there are many obstacles. <laughs> obstacles that we find in execution of our devotional service, in the environment, in relationship to other living beings, and just the difficulty of the process itself. And of course, our own material attachments make it even me more difficult. <laughs> so difficulties are part of life. And no one can escape difficulties. But one, when one sees what is the actual goal of life, or the success of one's activities, then one will say, will accept difficulties as opportunities to achieve the goal. Therefore, the principle of determination is so strong. Aditi, Aditi was determined. It's described in one complete chapter in the eighth canto of her austerities. And finally, by that austerity, she was successful. She pleased the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It says that the highest religious principle out of all the religious principles is to please Krishna. Mm -hmm. If we please Krishna, then everything else is automatically achieved by that one result. So therefore, the goal of execution of devotional service is to perform one's activity for the pleasure of the Lord. <laughs> there may be other results that come by one of one's effort, but the main goal is, will this please the Lord? <laughs> and pleasing the Lord is actually the success of life. People in this world try to please themselves, but the problem is, Nobody knows who they are. <laughs> they think that is body. And therefore, to satisfy their body, or the things in relationship to their body, they think is to please oneself. But the self is different than the body. The self is the spirit, and it has part of Krishna. So to please oneself means to come to the spiritual platform. <laughs> And to please and to perform activities on the spiritual platform means to serve the Lord with the idea of pleasing the Lord. Savai Pumso Paro Dharma Yato Bhakti Ahoksa Jayahuitakiya Priyata Ayatma Suprasidati. The highest form of religious activity is to please the Lord with unmotivated devotion. And that and the success of that and taktwa dehom purna chanmani naiti mameti so one goes back to Godhead. 
one leaves this material world and attains the supreme destination or the ultimate goal of life. So, Aditi, she was successful. But, it's interesting. What was her desire? She wanted her sons to be back in power again. But at the same time, the Lord also saw that the demigods were out of their position. And being the Lord, the Lord is equal to everyone. Krishna is equal. He doesn't favor anyone. Isn't that amazing? Whether the demons, the devotees, or any living entity, he equally relates to them. Why? Because he's the all-powerful loving father. He, see, he doesn't see their bodies, he sees them, their soul. So therefore, he sees every living entity as his part and parcel, therefore he treats everyone the same. Or, what is that sameness? For their best interest. So in that way, the Lord relates to everyone. But, it is explained that one who, who is devoted to the Lord, as opposed to one who is not devoted to the Lord, gets the direct favor of the Lord. Whereas those who are not devoted to the Lord, they get the favor of the Lord, but in an indirect way. Or sometimes they get smashed <laughs> by the material energy. And that's Krishna's mercy too. <laughs> but for the devotees, they know that to please the Lord or to serve the Lord means to receive the flavor of the Lord. And to receive the favor of the Lord mean, means everything becomes successful. So therefore, even though the Diti was motivated to have her sons back in power, especially King Indra and the demigods, still the Lord wanted to favor the demigods, so he appeared in his most beautiful form as a dwarf Brahmana, Vamana Dev. The Lord has so many wonderful qualities. And but what is one of his most outstanding quality? The quality that attracts the devotees more than anything to the Lord. What is that quality? Who knows? Huh? Beauty. Vamana Dev was so beautiful. <laughs> he came as a little 12-year-old dwarf. You know what a dwarf is. It's something much smaller than it's what it's supposed to be. <coughs> and he was so beautiful. I'll describe a little bit of his beauty in this particular... And if I can, can't see without my glasses, but I can try. So it is a very detailed description of the appearance of the Lord and how the whole scene was set for the Lord's appearance. I'll read some of it. I'm on chapter 18 of, of Canto 8. I'm around verse number 12 here. It says here, the Lord appeared in his original form with ornaments and weapons in hands. Although this ever-existing form is not visible in the material world, nonetheless he appeared in this form. Then in the presence of his father and mother, he assumed the form of Vamana, a brahmachari dwarf, a brahman dwarf, a dramachari, just like a theatrical actor. So that's interesting that the Lord appears as an actor on the stage. Why? Because he can perform any activity in any form and still be the same person. <laughs> he knows his identity, but he plays various roles. And each of the roles is also his identity. But, that's, but, each, but he has a particular identity for every particular role he wants to play. Just like on the stage. There's the actors, and they, they know who they are, but at the same time, they play another role. So the Lord was playing the role of a dwarf Brahman. Okay, I just want to get to describe his beauty. 
They gave him various gifts. He was surrounded by family members. Mother Earth gave him a deer skin. The demigod of the moon, who was the king of forests, gave him a Brahmin danda, the rod of a brahmachari. His mother gave him cloth for underwear, and the deity presiding over a heavenly kingdom offered him an umbrella. We see him right there on the altar there. There's, there's usually an umbrella with Vamana Dev. Can, is there an umbrella on that particular picture though? You know, there's just an effulgence, right? No umbrella. You always see him with an umbrella, beautiful white umbrella. Brahma gave him a water pot. The seven sages offered him kusa grass. Mother Saraswati gave him a string, string of Ruraksha beads. Everyone is giving gifts to the Lord. When the Lord appears, they're so inspired by his presence that all they want to do is offer him something. When you see something, when you're attracted to something, somebody, what do you want to do? You want to do something for them to please them. So giving gifts is one of the ways to show one's love for another person. He said he exhibited his Brahman effulgence. He, his, he surpassed in beauty that entire assembly, which was filled with many great saintly Brahmanas. So now he appeared, and he's described a little bit about all the gifts he received. He immediately went on his mission. Bali Maharaj, it's interesting, although Bali Maharaj was the king of the demons and now he had conquered the whole world, he had one outstanding, amazing quality. He liked to give charity to saintly persons. Isn't that interesting? Nowadays, I don't, I don't know if we really understand what a demon is nowadays, because you can't really tell who's a demon, who's not. <laughs> In this age, everything's mixed up. So a suit and tie walking down the street could be Mr. Demon. <laughs> or he could be just an ordinary person. But the demons were very much distinct. And they also followed what we call Vedic principles. And one of the Vedic principles that the demons understood, and they also do today, is that when you give in charity, you're, you're blessed by that gift of giving. How powerful charity is. And so Bali Maharaj had inclinations to give to saintly persons. So anyone who would come to Bali, he would give something. Ramana Dev walked into this amazing assembly. There were so many sacrifices going on, and Bali was, was presiding all of these sacrifices. As soon as the Lord walked in, his suffulgence was so beautiful, it blinded everybody in the, in the assembly. And everyone turned their attention to this beautiful little Brahmin boy. He had a Brahmin thread. It was visible, and everyone could see. But he was only 12 years old. But his beauty was outstanding, and no one could look at anything else. Bali Maharaj immediately understood this is a very special personality. He sat the Lord down, not knowing he was the Lord, and started to wash his feet, just to honor this great saintly person. And then he said, you have come to our assembly. Our assembly has been blessed by your, by your presence. I, have perf I am performing the a sacrifice, and therefore I am giving in charity. Please take some gift from me. The Lord didn't immediately answer Bali Maharaja's request. He thought about it. He said, I am only a little Brahmin boy. What do I need? I don't need anything. Bali said, but I want to give charity to you. You have appeared in my assembly. You have so many good qualities. Therefore, please accept my charity. Bali was enthusiastic. He didn't want to hear anything negative. The Lord said, well, actually, you know, I'm just a little boy. So just give me three steps of land. That's all. <laughs> 
just three steps. Well, he said, this is an insult. If you approach a, a rich person and he's willing to give you anything, my dear sir, my dear madam, I will give you anything, whatever you ask. Please give me five kunas. <laughs> that would be an insult, right? Right? A person who is just magnanimous, charitable, and inspired to give, and you ask for something insignificant, or when we say practically inconsequential. Bali was, he said, but I can give you an island, a planet. I can give you a, a good wife, nice family, anything you want, just ask. We are so inspired by your presence in our assembly. The Lord made a very interesting statement at this time, which is really fundamental to the practice of devotional service for all of us. The Lord said, if one is not satisfied with what they need, they'll never be satisfied. So I don't need much. <laughs> Interesting how materialistic people consider success is to get more, right? More money, more power, more fame, more different types of enjoyment, whatever way they want to come out with more right the program in life is more but who's happy <laughs> they keep getting more but all they ever do is never feel satisfied with what they have and still want more and still there's no satisfaction so Bali, and so the lord wanted to teach a very important principle that if you have what you need why do you need more <laughs> It's simply a botheration. It just causes one to divert one's attention to the real goal of life, away from the real goal of life, which is, of course, devotional service to the Lord. But Bali was insistent. Now, Sukracharya, he's the guru. He's a, he's a seminal guru. He's kind of like within the, what we say, the, the line of gurus. He's not what you call a Vaishnava guru. But still, he's very powerful. He's, the, he's saying to Bali, now Bali, you know, this is Vishnu. Don't give him any, don't promise him anything. Because if you do, he'll take everything away. Sukhachari could actually understand that this was the Lord who came to, un to take everything from Bali. Bali, even Bali heard that. Bali didn't pay any attention to that. Bali wanted to give charity to the Lord. He didn't care about the results. He was inspired just to offer something to the Lord, as much as he could. And therefore, now here's an interesting point, which is really fundamental to our practice of devotional service, is that Bali, Sukracharya was a spiritual master of Bali. Now you don't disobey your spiritual master because that is Guru Avagya, which is the greatest of all offense. And therefore, one's spiritual life will, will immediately go down <laughs> as soon as one disobeys the orders of the spiritual master or rejects the orders of the spiritual master. Bali rejected. But still, Bali was righteous in that statement. Why? Because Sukracharya deviated from the principles of a real spiritual master. He didn't bring a person closer to the Lord, he wanted to bring him away from the Lord. Sukracharya was motivated, thinking, if Bali gives everything away, what about me? <laughs> yeah, I'm his guru, and I'm going to lose also. So he was thinking, oh, this is not good, both for me and for Bali. And therefore he said, if you, even though you've made a promise, if you do not precede your promise with the syllable OM, then, you can, then that promise is not binding. And he says that if one makes a promise 
that causes one's best interest to go down. He was talking his material interests. Like if one gives away everything and becomes poverty-stricken and becomes a beggar because of that, then that kind of promise can be broken because it's against one's own interest. So he came up with all these sub-religious principles in order to try to encourage Bali to somehow or other not fulfill his promise. But Bali didn't care. He was inspired just to give something to the Lord. And he didn't care about his consequences. Isn't that interesting? How sometimes in our devotional service we calculate, is this good for me or is this not good for me? But in devotional service, the calculation is, is this good for Krishna? <laughs> Is this going to please Krishna? Is this going to please the spiritual master? And then when one calculates that, that then one's best, the best interest is served. <laughs> because personal calculation means desire to fulfill material needs or desires. Like that. So Bali was very much, what we say, fixed in his promise. And Sukracharya tried everything. He said, you know, you can lie in order to protect your own interest. He gave him so many statements that, you know, if one's life is in danger, they can lie. To protect another person's life, they can lie. They can, to save one's uh, material, what we say, possessions, and not to become poverty-stricken, one can also speak an untruth. He quoted Shastra, but not pure Shastra. Shastra which is motivated by material activities or karma conduct like that. Bali didn't want to hear anything. Isn't this amazing? Bali, now he's starting to realize, yeah, this is Vishnu. So the Lord said, okay, you have given me three steps of land, I will take it. Bali agreed. If that's all you want, three steps. The first step, the Lord took the upper planetary systems, and I'm sorry, the, the middle planetary systems and the lower planets with one step. He was just a Brahmin boy. He was small. He expanded himself in his universal form, and he became the universe itself. It says that he was covering the entire creation simply by his transcendental form. All of a sudden, the whole assembly saw something very amazing. The Lord had assumed a form unlike anything they've ever saw before. And with one step, he took two-thirds of the creation. And the second step, he touched the higher planetary systems, and his foot, in making the step, cut a hole in the outer coverings of the material universes. Because the material universes are covered by the layers of the material energy. And each layer is 10 times thicker. But the Lord's foot went right through. As the foot was going up, Lord Brahma saw, wow, here comes the Lord's feet. He took out his water pot, his kamandalu, and started to wash the foot of the Lord while the Lord was moving his feet up into the higher levels of the, going past Satyaloka. And that water was actually one of, the re one of the elements of the Ganga. Ganga is made up of three different elements. And one of the elements was the water that washed the Lord's lotus feet as Vamanadeva. Like that. So Ganga Devi came through. <laughs> and Brahma and all the demigods were so, what we say, exalted just by washing the feet of the Lord. And now, after taking two steps, everybody in the assembly is thinking, what we're going to do now? <laughs> the Lord said, came back to his little form as dwarf Brahman and said, you owe me one more step, there's nothing left. You're a thief. You're a liar. You offered three steps. Where's my third step? Bali didn't know what to do. Sukradhar Acharya was chastising his disciple. I told you not to do it. 
everyone in the assembly was shocked. And finally, Bali didn't know what to do, but then he understood. But the Lord said, now because you have lied to me, this is interesting, how the Lord treated Bali, the Bali wanted to give everything to the Lord he wanted, but when he tried to give everything, and the Lord wanted three steps, and he was only ta taking two, and that's all he could give was two, the Lord said, you're a thief, <laughs> you're a cheater, you're a liar. <laughs> Imagine, after doing his best, he gets criticized, and then the Lord says, he calls for this, the, the, the ropes of a suki, which is the mystical stay, snake, and the snake comes and ties up Bali, and he's like a criminal tied up, can't move. The Lord says, where's my third step? <laughs> Finally, when he was, when everything was gone, Bali started to think, well, I do have one thing left, my body. So my dear Lord, please place your third step on my head. I offer my life to you in devotion. The Lord was pleased with them. And as soon as that happened, Prahlad Maharaj appeared in the assembly. Now who's Prahlad Maharaj? He's the grandfather of Bali Maharaj. He's the father of Virochan, and Virochan is the father of Bali Maharaj. And so Pallad Maharaj appeared in the assembly to bless the entire assembly. And it was explained that Pallad Maharaj also offered everything to the Lord. And then following in the footsteps of his great-grandfather, or his grandfather who was great, he offered everything to the Lord. Pallad Maharaj saw the whole situation and started to glorify the Lord and how the Lord is very kind and very merciful. Bali's still attacked. Now, Prabhupada writes in the purports, this is really interesting. Bali could not really offer his body to the Lord because the body of the living entity doesn't belong to us anyway. Sometimes we think, well, my body. But is it yours? Who gave it to you? Did you create it? So my body is not really my body. It's a gift that comes by the way of material energy. It's awarded to us. So the body is a material tabernacle where the soul resides either to enjoy the body artificially or to use the body for the service of the Lord. So therefore, in any case, whether material, spiritual, the body doesn't belong to us. We can see even in life, if a person works for a person, that person owns that person in one sense. He may be getting some pay, but still that body is used as a service for the other person. So in all phases of life, we usually give our body to someone else or to something else, or even to, to our own selfish desires, but it's not ours. It's not ours. Therefore, and what Prabhupada goes on to explain that Bali Maharaj's last supplication or submission to the Lord was not really a point of surrender, but that's all he had. But that's all he had, because the body was already belonging to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the Lord was pleased by Bali Maharaj's... And Bali, and why did Krishna do this to him? Because Krishna wants his, to see his devotee become, what we say, fully Krishna conscious. Bali Maharaj, it's interesting. He was a demon. He was fighting against the demigods who are Krishna's servants. Yet his father was, a grandfather was Pallad Maharaj, and he had so many good qualities. And his outstanding quality is he just loved to give in charity especially to persons who are worthy of that charity, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord was so pleased with Bali that actually he freed him from the ropes of Vasuki and he told him, now you can go to a place called Sutala, which is in the lower planetary systems, and it's more opulent 
than the demigods, heavenly planets. There you can reside as the king of that planet, and after some time, when you fulfill that term of activity, you will become king of heaven. <laughs> it's interesting. The Lord took everything away. He had nothing left. From, from what we say, from, what they say, from riches to rags, right? But then from rags to riches, he went back the other. The Lord gave him everything back. It's interesting. In devotional service, sometimes we want material opulences or those things which give what we say pleasure to the senses along with the worship of the devotee, the, the, the Lord. This is a kind of bhakti. It's more like Vaikuntha bhakti. It's like a devotee likes the Lord but also likes material opulences. Wants to enjoy material opulences but at the same time wants to devote their life to the Lord. But if the Lord sees a little bit of attachment to those opulences, which diverts one's attention to the, away from the worship of the Lord, the Lord will arrange something for that person to lose that material offense. And that's what happened to Bali. The Lord took everything away. Everything. But because Bali surrendered everything, and he was happy, he said, now I become your servant, I don't ask for anything else. In other words, Bali was using material opulence for material enjoyment. But at the same time, he had some devotion. So Krishna sma and Vamanadeva smashed that attachment and gave him bhakti. But at the same time, after he gave him bhakti, he gave him back all the opulences again. This is the life of a, a devotee. A devotee comes to Krishna consciousness and we have attachments. So we say, my dear Lord, you can take my attachments. So we start surrendering to everything. But as we, Prabhupada uses himself as the ideal example. When he came on the Jaladuta, Prabhupada had nothing. He had one thing, the instructions of his spiritual master. He had two things and the determination to carry it out. We hear, when Prabhupada left Calcutta to come to America, he had seven, was it, 40 rupees. But he didn't even take those 40 rupees away. He gave it to his son and said, I can't spend them in America. They're useless. You take them. Prabhupada had nothing. He took. He came on the ship 35 days on the ocean. Two heart attacks, seasickness, so many problems. Prabhupada thought he was going to die. He was sure he was going to die. But he never gave up his determination to continue his mission. He simply depended on the Lord. And the Lord actually made everything wonderful. So when Prabhupada came, we understand, he had nothing. He had no contacts, no friends. He had one contact in Butler, Pennsylvania was going to sponsor him for one month. Prabhupada got a chance. When he went to the agency, they say, how long do you want to stay? He said, I'll stay for two months. So he asked for another month. They gave it to him. Prabhupada was there for two months. He was thinking, what can I do in two months? And he, all he had was a little contact in one small city in Pennsylvania with one family. And that's all. But after, by, by the year 1976, Prabhupada said, I came with nothing, now I have everything. <laughs> I have so many temples, I have so many devotees, I have so much money. Krishna took everything away, but then he gave it all back. <laughs> and this is how Krishna works. When we want something for ourselves, we can't, we, that object can, makes us <coughs> less enthusiastic in our devotional service. So a devotee will think, what can I give to Krishna? My time, my intelligence, my abilities, my resources, and ultimately my life. And Krishna takes that and he gives everything back. 
Now, you shouldn't think, well, if I just give everything, he's going to give it all back to me. That doesn't work either. <laughs> because Krishna knows the, our hearts. But a devotee thinks, what is the greatest gift? Bhakti. There's nothing that can compare to bhakti in this material world. Bali Maharaj was the ideal example. He showed that he had, he had not only material opulence, he had it all. <laughs> he was the king of the universes. All the planetary systems were ruled by Bali Maharaj. But he was, he was attracted to devotional service to the Lord and he didn't mind giving it all up. <coughs> and the Lord treated him kind of roughly. Didn't make it easy for him. He put a lot of pressure on him. And then when he did surrender, he said, you know, you're a thief. But then finally, by the mercy of Prahlad Maharaj, who appeared in the assembly, Bali was willing to accept whatever the Lord wanted. And the Lord said, because you have pleased me, and because you have given everything up for my service, therefore I give it all back to you. Because <laughs> the Lord doesn't need anything. He's full, he's Atmarama, he's self-satisfied. He only wants our bhakti. But he'll take away our material possessions and material activities so we can incre increase our bhakti, like that. For one who is not sincere in devotional service, when Krishna takes things away, we think, maybe I'm in the wrong movement. <laughs> maybe I should go to these places where you, what is it, there's gurus and there's swamis, and they just give you these mantras, and you can get all, anything you want by chanting these mantras. You get power, you get prestige, you get material facilities. Right? We're in the wrong movement. Haribo. <laughs> Krishna's going to take it all away. But he gives something that is the greatest gift. He gives himself. He gives him. But he also gives his devotee material opulences too. When the devotee really wants only the Lord, the Lord gives everything back. He says, here, take it. Use it in my service. Enjoy it also. The devotee can also doesn't live in a poverty-stricken situation because the Lord is so kind to the devotee. He wants to see the devotee happy. And at the same time, when the devotee is fixed on devotional service to the Lord, the material opulences are just incidental. But they're there. Krishna gives them. Like that. As Prabhupada said, I started with 40 rupees, now I have 40 crores. <laughs> A crore is 10 million rupees. So you can imagine how much that is. 400 million, 400, was that, 4 billion rupees? I can't imagine how much money that is. It's millions of dollars. So then, so therefore, bhakti is like that. When you want something material and you want Krishna, Krishna may also give you something material. But if he sees that that material gift causes you to go away or to ask again the second time doesn't do it again he knows that why should I put my devotee in a situation where they become more entangled in material life so the Lord will the Lord is called Hari one who takes everything away but he replaces him with himself so a devotee always think, I don't want anything, I want Krishna. <laughs> That's all I want. Why? Because when you have Krishna, you have everything. So a devotee knows, whatever Krishna is giving me, just use it for my, his service. That's all. Manaso deho geho yo kichu mor arpi tu tu alpade nanda kishore. Bhakti Vinoda gives the perfect prayer. What is that perfect prayer? He's praying, I have so many things, but they're yours. They belong to you. Manaso deho geho. That means my body, that's yours. My family, that's yours. My wealth, that's yours. My my property that I have, my home. Deha, geha. It's yours. Everything belongs to you. And that is Krishna consciousness like that. 
So the devotee becomes satisfied. Now the demons, when they saw what happened to their leader, they weren't so happy. <laughs> so they started to attack the Lord. But the demigods were also there, and they became powerful by the Lord's presence. And they started to beat back the demons. And then Bali stepped in and said, don't fight. <clears throat> don't fight. This is the Lord's will where we have to abide by the Lord's will. And Prabhupada gives an interesting point. He actually told the demons, it's not a good time to fight. Find another time when we're, when it's, in other words, when you want to be successful at something, one of the things that you should consider is the time you try it, whether the situation is right or not right. If the situation is right by, by proper evaluation, then something becomes, we want to go to Vrindavan, but maybe it's not always the right time to go. But when you go at the right time, then Vrindavan is Vrindavan. Just to use an example. So timing is so important in the way we execute our devotional service, like that. And so, and providence is the, is the ultimate principle of success. What is providence? That destiny will bring about the desired result, like that. So Bali's wife, Vinya Bali, what was her name? Vin, Vidya Bali, huh? Vinyavali, yeah, Vinyavali. She spoke up and she started to glorify the Lord. Brahma wanted to glorify the Lord. She interrupted, said, Hey, Brahma, I'm going to speak. <laughs> she was so enthusiastic to glorify what she, what the, what Krishna did or what Brahmana did for her husband. She was so grateful. She was thanking the Lord and glorifying the Lord that our family has become more and more auspicious, our opulences have increased beyond. We have real opulences now. There's two kinds of, Prabhupada talks about this. There's the opulences you get by material endeavors and then the opulence that Krishna gives you. One is temporary and one is permanent. If Krishna gives you something material, through the process of devotional service, that stays with you. That doesn't dwindle or are lost by time. What we get by our own efforts in material life is subject to the time element. Subject to the time element. And so therefore she was understanding. Bali got so many things, but it was all thievery. Now he's got the real wealth Krishna has given him. The king of Sutala planet, the Lord actually became his servant. The Lord said, I will reside with you. So on the planet of Sutala, which is one of the, the lower heavenly planets, they're called the yeah, lower heavenly planets because they have material opulences there, although it's a lower planet. Krishna resides there as the doorkeeper of Bali. He opens the door and closes it for Bali. The Lord becomes his personal servant. Amazing. How much the Lord loves his devotee? devotee? One cannot estimate or evaluate or even imagine how much the Lord loves his devotee. Devotee is in the heart of his, in his heart, and he knows no one but his devotee. The devotee, the Lord will do anything for his devotee. He says, what is my worth? I have, I, what is my worth? My devotees. They make me worthwhile. Because of my devotees, I am great. <laughs> he gives all credit to his devotees. That's Krishna. Imagine that. He's the greatest. We become great when we serve Krishna. But he's thinking, because of my devotee's devotion to me, I have become great. <laughs> That's Krishna. <laughs> That's how much he loves his devotees. So one who surrenders to the Lord in devotional service, the Lord actually becomes the servant of his devotee. Of course, we shouldn't think, oh, 
I'm going to make the Lord my servant. That's not the idea. Prabhupada says there's a competition between the devotee and the Lord. The Lord wants to serve his devotee and the Lord devotee wants to serve the Lord. But guess who wins? The Lord, because he never loses. <laughs> so he's a better servant. Although the devotee tries to serve and Krishna can always serve more and better. And it's amazing how Krishna does things. We also see in our life things just happen by his will or by his grace when one surrenders in devotion to the Lord. And so Bali became exalted and Bali is now, he is called a Mahajan. Mahajano yena katasapanta, that the re true religious principles are hidden within the hearts of what is called the great souls. Sometimes people say, well, what is real religious principles? How do we find religious principles? There are so many shastras, there are so many saints, there are so many, what we say, apparent contradictory principles. But this verse, Mahajano Yena Kata Sapanta, which is the last line in one verse from the Mahabharata, which says that religious principles are a secret. And when one serves a great soul, they reveal the truth of religious principles. It's hidden in the heart of great souls. And there are 12 Mahajans. Brahma, Shiva, the four Kumaras, Kapila Dev. Mm -mm. Mm. Um, I was thinking with Motstead. Swayam Bhuva Manu, Manu, Prahlad Maharaj, Vyasaki, which is Sukadev Goswami. Huh? Who? Janaka Maharaj, yes, the father of, of Sita Devi. And Yamaraj, that's what I was thinking. Bishmadev. These persons know the truth of religious principles. As devotees of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya appeared in the Sampradaya of Lord Brahma. So Brahma is our head of our Sampradaya. So he is teaching the religious principles, but they are coming by way of Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is actually the foundation for the execution of our devotional service. So in this age, the greatest form of surrender to the Lord is to surrender to Krishna's holy name. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's the foundation and the structure where everything else is built simply on Krishna's name. Krishna's name is Krishna. Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. Krishna has appeared in this age in his name and Mahaprabhu is the giver of the name and also the teacher of the name at the same time. So one who chants the holy names of the Lord will gradually want to give up material desires and attachments. That is real chanting. If we're chanting the holy names and we're still attached to material life, that means we're not chanting properly. Or what we say, we're not chanting with the proper understanding, proper consciousness. So the holy name is the higher taste. <laughs> what is that verse? Uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that, you know, that when one gets a higher taste, the lower taste goes. <laughs> what is the lower taste? Material sense gratification. <laughs> Actually, it's not even a taste. Material sense gratification doesn't give you any happiness. All it does is prolong our, our sojourn in this material world. Real happiness is Brahma Sokyam, transcendental knowledge, coming by way of transcendental activities. So this is the mercy of the Lord in this age. Bali became glorious. And now the Lord exalted him to the position of a Mahajan. He actually became one of the great persons from a demon who was working against the demigods to a great soul who now is favored by the Lord 
as one of the greatest of all personalities like that. So the Lord descends in this world simply to show favor to his devotees and to remove irreligion and to bring back religious principles. But really why he comes to please his devotees. So we get a chance today and every year at this time to glorify this beautiful incarnation of the Lord called Vaimana Day, like that. And his qualities, his activities, and simply by hearing about the Lord and speaking about the Lord. It says, usually at the end of every particular Leela in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it gives you some phala, phalam. Phalam means fruit. What is the fruit? It says that one who hears this narration will be freed from all sinful activity and will take to the places of pure devotion and service. Simply by hearing it. There's no other qualification required. Just to hear the glories of the Lord. It's so powerful that it removes any, any opportunity for any kind of sinful activity and fixes one in devotional service like that. So this is the glory of the Lord's appearance. When he appears, everything becomes auspicious. And everything, everyone benefits, including the demons. <laughs> like that. And then, of course, as the pastime goes on, the demigods regain their position in the heavenly planets, and Diti was very happy. <laughs> Aditi, not Diti, Aditi. <clears throat> So this is a beautiful pastime. It's in the eighth canto. There's about six chapters, starting with chapter number 18 and going on to chapter 23. And from 18 to 23, the whole story. Please take time and read. Prabhupada's purports are amazing. It teaches us what it means to become detached from material suffering <laughs> everyone wants to become free from suffering there's only one reason for se suffering sense gratification <laughs> sense gratification leads to suffering <laughs> and devotional service leads to freedom from all suffering ultimately. and situated in a position where one is always moving closer to Krishna Hare Krishna. Shri Bhavana Dev Ki. Any questions? Yes, uh, Savitri Mataji. Does that mean that disciple cannot fully surrender to the Lord in the presence of the, his spiritual master if or if he doesn't serve the spiritual master fully? The uh, spiritual master is the representative of the Lord to accept service on behalf of the Lord. One cannot approach the Lord directly, but one can approach the Lord directly through his direct representative. So it's direct, but at the same time, indirect. Why? Because the spiritual master represents the Lord in the material realm. So one who serves the spiritual master, that service goes to the Lord. There's no difference. <laughs> Yasya prashada, bhagavad prashada, yasya prashadan, nagati kutopi. So we sing this prayer every morning. What does it say? That by the mercy of the spiritual master, one gets the mercy of Krishna. And without the mercy of the spiritual master, one cannot get the mercy of Krishna. Like that. So therefore, pleasing the spiritual master means pleasing Krishna. 
There's no difference. Bali rejected his spiritual master because his spiritual master had rejected the principle of devotion. And therefore, he was apparently acting wrongly, but at the same time, he was transcendental in the sense that he accepted a higher principle. If the spiritual master says, don't surrender to Krishna, then he's no longer a spiritual master. <laughs> The spiritual master says, you know, well, you don't have to follow the four regulative principles. You can follow these other four. No meat, no fish, no eggs, no gambling. These are the four new regulative principles. Well, you know he's a bogus. <laughs> and we find that. People like to adjust, or so-called those who have some spiritual power, like to present themselves and adjust things. And therefore, eternal religious principles cannot be adjusted. One must accept the path of the Mahajans, like that. Yeah. So one must know what a spiritual master is, and one, when one accepts a spiritual master, one should follow the spiritual master, as one's, what we say, life and soul. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Bali Maharaj. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so Mother Yerke. Yeah. You mentioned you also one sentence from Shri Yeah, that's. Yeah. Mm. Our tomorrow is appearance, yes. Bhakti Kai. Srila Bhakti Vinota Kaur also was a visionary and he also predicted the appearance of Srila Prabhupada as the personality who would appear to bring Krishna consciousness around the world. In 1896, which was the same year as Prabhupada's appearance on this planet, Bhaktivinoda Kaur had just finished a book called The Teachings and Precepts of, of Lord Chaitanya, which is a, it's a small book, it's about 96 pages. And uh, after completing that book, which was just a, a fundamental understanding of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, he sent that book to some of the major universities in the world by post. Later on, the devotees who were doing preaching in the libraries found that same book in McGill University in Canada and showed it to Prabhupada. But later on, we found out that that same book went to other universities also, all around the world. So it's interesting that the person who would take the teachings of Lord Chaitanya around the world appeared in the same year that the book of the life of Lord Chaitanya's teachings went around the world. You might say, well, that's coincidental. But on the spiritual platform, nothing is accidental or coincidental. It was the Lord's arrangement. So Prabhupada's appearance was indicated by Bhakti Vinod Thakur sending that book all around the world. Same year. There are so many wonderful things about Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. His teachings, his writings, his, um, his understanding of the science of Bhakti in such detail. 
He's written two very outstanding books that Srila Prabhupada highly recommended us to read. One is called Jaiva Dharma. You've heard of Jaiva Dharma? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Chaitanya Shikshamrita. These two books are real jewels for, for devotees in the ISKCON movement, especially Jaiva Dharma. It's the whole science of bhakti in detail and given in a dialogue. It's a dialogue, it's a discussion between gurus and, teach and students on the science of bhakti. So Prabhupada wanted us, he actually recommended we read that book. And Bhaktivinoda Rathakur, his songs. His songs are so deep in spiritual mellows, goes into the heart of bhakti. He puts, he, puts, he puts himself in the position of an ordinary person and speaks his, uh, his heart. He says, Amada jivan sade pape rate nahi opoyero lesa. My dear Lord, Amada jivan, my life, sade pape rate is full of sin. <laughs> He's the greatest devotee. He's a pure devotee, but he sees himself as the lowest of the low. Is that some eulogy or some pretense in order to show some kind of humility? Persons may think like that, but actually, the more you make progress in spiritual life, the more you realize how fallen you are. Isn't that interesting? That is the characteristic of spiritual advancement. Why? Because Krishna is so great. And as we make advancement, we realize how great he is and how small we are. And how much we're covered by the material energy. Although we may consider ourselves, you know, advanced. <laughs> so a devotee understands through the process of advancement. So Bhakti Vinod is exhibiting that mood that I'm so small, I'm so low. What is my quality? My quality is simply your mercy. A devotee knows what is my success in life? Prabhupada makes this point. The endeavor you make is not the success of your devotional service. It's the mercy of the Lord. So therefore one has to endeavor in such a way as to bring the Lord's mercy along with that endeavor. <clears throat> so what does that mean? That means one has to pray for the Lord's mercy. One, has, one should try to please the Lord in everything we do and especially please the Lord's devotees. And if that's done, then the mercy comes like that. There's always mercy, but we need a lot of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> we need a lot of mercy. Therefore, you can't get enough mercy, especially in this age of Kali, where material life is so, what we say, prevalent, that it becomes very difficult to execute devotional service. <laughs> so these are some of the qualities of Bhakti Vinoda So I would think if we want to focus on anything, it's mostly his, his songs. The songs of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. This is a wonderful thing. Devotees should get together and do bhajans. We do bhajans with the holy name, and that's wonderful. But come together and have bhajan night and sing the prayers of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Or Srila Narottam Das Thakur, both. The Bhakti Vinod Thakur's prayers really touch the heart and, go and take us deeper into the mellows of Krishna consciousness. The things that bring about the stirrings of the heart, the attachments to Krishna in various ways. So, so that was another wonderful gift by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, his songs. Kiva jayo jaya gora chande that's Bhakti Vinod Thakur. What is that song? Oh, I just sang it. Oh. 
Um, what is the song we sing just before class? Bhakti Vinodhuk one. Jai Radhava Madhava. Here's your own, here's the favorite one by Bhakti Vinodhuk one. Sarira Avidya Jau. It's one of the more popular ones. <laughs> Bhakti Vinod Thakur has given us a treasure house of wonderful bhajans and, and songs like that. So tomorrow is a half day fast. Fasting is feasting and feasting is fasting. <laughs> Become fast. Look forward to feasting and fasting. Prabhupada said there's no difference. Can we understand that? Okay, so we'll begin uh, Gorarti now, and uh, and then uh, the devotees have cooked a wonderful feast in honor of uh, Vamadadev's appearance. So that'll be the final, the finale of tonight. So thank you all for coming. So everyone, chant, dance, and. Become enthusiastic to glorify the Lord as we chant Gaur Arti. Srila Prabhupada ki. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur ki. Gaur Premarande. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai.